Ross is the best-selling author of various books on the history of art and architecture. Some of his previous works include Brunelleschi's Dome and The Judgment of Paris. When I was 13 years old, my dad gave me a copy of another book by Ross called Michelangelo and the Pope's Ceiling. And it was actually this book which first got me interested in art. So for that reason, I'm very excited to have this conversation with Ross and I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, sending this one out to my man Killer B. So just to give a bit of context for the listeners, Ross, what was the early life of Michelangelo like? Um, In some ways, it was atypical of a Renaissance artist in that he came uh, from what, if uh, we believe him, was a very good family. And in fact, an aristocratic family, uh, the Canossa family, who were uh, rulers of Mantua, rulers of Tuscany at one point in the Middle Ages. Um, But they were... Uh, you know, they were sort of downwardly mobile. And by the time uh, Michelangelo was born in 1475, uh, the uh, family were sort of on their uppers. And uh, his father was a kind of minor public official. Um, he didn't have a lot of money. Um, you know, uh, I think he was a little bit work shy and things like that. And so the family was um, a little bit poor. Um, and I think they would have wanted uh, Michelangelo to go into the banking industry or something like that, something that was going to make money for them. Uh, But of course, he decided at a young age, probably at 11 or 12, that he was going to become an artist. Uh, And by this point, his mother had passed away. He lost her when he was six years old. Um, He had some uh, brothers who, like their father, were a little bit work shy and uh, uh, throughout his life uh, caused him various problems. Um, but he grew up in Florence. He was born outside of Florence in a, a place called Caprese, about 60 miles from Florence to the east, um, a place that now canly has rechristened itself Caprese Michelangelo, naming itself after him. But really, as a, a, a child, a baby, he returned to Florence with his father. Um, his father had a post as uh, a, a public official, a magistrate in Caprese, and he just happened to be born there to this Florentine family, uh, returned to Florence, uh, was set out to a wet nurse uh, who was the wife of a stone carver, a mason uh, in Settignano. And um, Michelangelo later said, probably jokingly, that the skill that he got, <clears throat> excuse me, the skill that he got and possibly also the passion he had for working in stone came from the fact that he was suckled as a baby uh, by the wife of a stonemason. And so he attributed part of his genius to that. One of the few people he would ever attribute any of his genius to. It's actually, it was quite surreal for me because when I was 13, I actually lived in Settignano for four months because oh, um, really? my, Wonderful. Mom, my mom had a um, studying fellowship at Villa Itati, which is just oh, in, that, right, of course. in that area. And, um, and I probably read your book and just for the listeners, reading Ross's book, which we're going to talk about today, Michelangelo and the Pope's Ceiling, was actually the book that uh, first got me interested in art, which was why this was so exciting to speak with you. But I probably read your book about six months after we got back to Australia. And in reading it, it was just so surreal for me to think that I'd been living for four months in probably the same sort of five square kilometre area that Michelangelo had grown up as a... And and did you know at the time that Settignano was where uh, he, he... partially grew up it might have been mentioned to me but again I my interests were um yeah not very sort of artistic at that stage so it probably just flew right over my head with um a, the uh countess of uh Canosa um uh I read in your book that um he later verified or got verification that that connection was actually true. Was that actually true or was that just at that stage in Michelangelo's life, he was just so prestigious that it was it was actually almost a benefit to them to be connected with him? 
That's right. There was a, a count of Canossa in his day, and uh, Michelangelo contacted him, uh, and uh, this uh, character, who is at that time a much less impressive figure than Michelangelo, uh, confirmed that they were related, uh, which Michelangelo, who he inherited nothing from his father, really, except a kind of snobbery about the uh, the noble origins of the family. Uh, and because his father really uh, stuck to this story as well. Um, but I, it, it's never been uh, proven since then. I, 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 things such as that, I think, are probably difficult to prove. The family legend was that uh, the Canossa family, there were so many of them named uh, Buonarotto, Buonarotto Canossa, uh, that they ultimately became known as the Buonarotti, and that's why their surname um, is different from Canossa. And that, I mean, it's a plausible story, and it goes back, uh, you know, two hundred plus years before Michelangelo was born. So, um, it's uh, it, it might be a true story, and it made Michelangelo happy. I think he would would have been uh, uh, happy to be known as an uh, as happy to be known uh, as an aristocrat uh, as he was to be known as a great artist. And you know, in combination, I think he felt the two things were a a, 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 a very a potent way to face the world. So he was living in Settignano, and as you say in your book, his family didn't react quite very well to his interest in art. Um, what happened next? Well, yes, he uh, he says that his uncle, uh, his uncle Francesco, who was a kind of small time money lender, he would have had something like a, um, I guess, uh, a, a bench where he would exchange money in the center of Florence. Um, they wanted Michelangelo to go into business, essentially to do what Francesco was doing, um, but in order to help the family fortunes. Uh, but this young kid said he wanted to be an artist, and uh, the family were not at all happy with the idea of someone from the great Canossa family going into trade, with working with his hands, which is what he would have been doing as, uh, as, as a sculptor or a, as a painter. He would have been a, a tradesman. Um, and so they tried to dissuade him on w the one hand for family prestige and on the other for the, ironically, the lack of money that they thought he would, uh, it'll be in deficit uh, with. Um, and, but he won out uh, and he was apprenticed to Domenico Ghirlandaio, uh, probably at about the age of 12 or 13, as early as the, the first documentation of him having contact with uh, Domenico Ghirlandaio who was a great uh, frescoist, a uh, great uh, painter of altarpieces, is 1487 when he's 12, but he seems officially to have entered the studio of Ghirlandaio, which was a large studio, sort of Ghirlandaio and company. Now, he had lots of assistants, including his family members. He went into it in 1488 at the age of 13, but was only with Ghirlandaio for a year or two at most. Ordinarily, an artist would have apprenticed for seven years, sometimes even longer, uh, learning the trade. And then so at the age of if you enter at 13 as an apprentice, you finish up at 20, 21 and maybe set up your own shop and attract apprentices and try to attract custom from patrons and things like that. Uh, but Michelangelo took a very different uh, tack, which was to leave the painting studio uh, probably willingly. Now, there was a story that he and Ghirlandaio didn't get on, which is entirely believable considering the irascible character that Michelangelo ultimately became. Um, and he went into the a, a kind of sculpture garden slash academy, maybe an early version of an art school combined with a philosophical academy, which was run by, or at least overseen by, Lorenzo de, de Medici, Lorenzo the Magnificent, the grandson of uh, Cosmo Ivecchio, the uh, sort of founder of the uh, political dynasty in Florence. Um, and there he spent the next couple of years surrounded um, not just by art and artists. Uh, the, the art school was run by someone named Bertoldo, who was a um, kind of uh, a protege of the great Donatello, who was an artist that Michelangelo much admired. Donatello had died before Michelangelo was born, uh, but this was one of his students, now well on in age. Uh, and so Michelangelo presumably learned about sculpture from him. But the crucial thing is then that he 
learns about sculpture rather than painting. He had maybe 18 months, two years maximum with Durlindayo learning painting. And then he really switched horses in midstream and goes into sculpture. Do you think he was naturally inclined towards sculpture or the fact that he was uh, part of that academy and surrounded by those people is what gave him his first inkling for sculpture? That's a very good question. And I, I think it's difficult to say. I think he was much more attracted to this school set up by Lorenzo and Bertoldo, much more attracted to it, maybe philosophically and in, in terms of the personnel than he was uh, with Ghirlandaio. Um, but it's, uh, and we only have what he tells us, which is not a lot, and that is that Ghirlandaio was jealous of him. Uh, is, in some ways, it's hard to believe that uh, someone as, as accomplished as Ghirlandaio was at that point. He had done work for the Pope in Rome in the early 1480s, uh, when Michelangelo was a, a toddler, essentially. It's difficult to, to imagine him being that jealous of someone who's 12, 13, 14. And what you wanted as a uh, as a painter was talented apprentices to come in and give glory to your shop. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and you would keep them with you and they would help uh, help enhance your own reputation. So I'm not entirely sure that Ghirlandai was jealous of this 14-year-old. Do, does that um, story of Ghirlandai's supposed jealousy come to us through Condivi's biography or through Vasari? It, it comes through Condivi. Right. Uh, and which in, in many ways, <clears throat> and just for the listeners, the uh, there are these two biographies uh, written uh, uh, with, within his own lifetime. In fact, there's a third one, but it's very short. Uh, 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 and, and extremely short, it's 32 lines. So it's not not exactly a big, fat biography. Uh, but uh, uh, this apprentice friend of Michelangelo, Ascanio Condivi, wrote one, uh, which is in many ways the autobiography of Michelangelo. In some ways, he's Michelangelo's ghost writer. Um, and he repeats, he tells everything that Michelangelo wants to become part of the the public record, the story of his life. And much of that then is also taken up by this other friend of Michelangelo, who also does a biography of him, that's Giorgio Vasari. And there were lots of, uh, they they tell similar stories, both of which uh, they probably get from each other and also, of course, from Michelangelo. So yes, we we don't have Ghirlandaio's version of events. We don't have Lorenzo de Medici's version of events either. But I think Lorenzo was a talented um, scout for artists and I think he probably recognized quite immediately uh, that this child uh, was extremely talented with the hammer and chisel. Where, where would where would Lorenzo have seen, would Lorenzo have visited Gillandai's workshop and that's where he first saw Michelangelo's work or was he recommended to Lorenzo? I, I said, I, once again, we don't really know. I don't think there would have been a kind of contact uh, with Lorenzo going into the studio. I mean, this is something if we were going to make a film, we would have Lorenzo coming into the studio and, and seeing the work of the young Michelangelo. I don't think it worked that way. It um, was uh, probably that he just, Michelangelo heard about the sculpture school where they had uh, Donatello's assistant and he would have gravitated towards that. And once he was within that milieu, uh, he would have encountered Lorenzo because Lorenzo does seem to have taken an active interest in what was going on there. And of course, the upshot then is that Lorenzo takes him, takes this uh, kid who at this point is about 15, and takes him into his house, takes him into the Medici Palace, um, and in many ways begins raising him up. Um, he eats at the table. He's um, becomes friends or at least acquaintances with Lorenzo's uh, sons, Lorenzo's children, uh, who are uh, somewhat in similar in age to him. There's a, a range of them. Um, and then crucially, I think more importantly than meeting uh, these uh, sons of Lorenzo, one of whom is going to become Pope, ultimately, Leo X in 1513, but more important for Lorenzo, or sorry, for Michelangelo, is that Lorenzo then affects the introduction to the intelligentsia of Florence, who, of course, are clustering around uh, Lorenzo in this sort of platonic or neoplatonic academy that Lorenzo is has taken under his wing and is um, is really becoming the patron for. And so he, Michelangelo, undoubtedly meets 
the greatest intellectual superstars of, of, of the century, really. Marsilio Ficino, who was the man who translated the uh, complete works of Plato from Greek into Latin, which was an la absolutely landmark moment in the history of thought. Uh, he would have met the greatest classical scholar of the century, uh, Angelo Poliziano, Politian, uh, who uh, took an active, active interest in Michelangelo um, and, and I, I think helped him with some of his work, gave him ideas for it. Uh, Politian was also, besides being a great classical scholar, he was also a, a great poet who influenced other artists such as Botticelli uh, through his poetry. Um, and then Pico della Mirandola, uh, this uh, figure who uh, was both a, a, a Plato scholar or an, a, a lover of Plato's philosophy, uh, and also uh, very interested in Jewish philosophy in the the Kabbalah and things like that. And so Michelangelo becomes um, immersed not just in the workshop with the clanging of hammers and the chipping of marble and things like that, uh, but also the um, exchange of ideas uh, within uh, Lorenzo's academy and within Lorenzo's household. Well, just for the listeners then, could you explain what Neoplatonism is and perhaps talk about how Mirandola and Ficino's sort of Christianized Neoplatonism differed to uh, early forms of Neoplatonism as well. Sure, sure. It's, I mean, it's very difficult to uh, describe uh, what exactly this was because, of course, there were various, uh, various streams of it. But, I mean, it, it, they did not call themselves Neoplatonists. That's a, a term that uh, is used later. Uh, but in many ways, uh, the, that is a good explanation of what they were trying to do. They were reviving Plato. Uh, Plato uh, uh, had already been revived in the third century AD um, uh, by uh, uh, Plotinus, who was a, a great, uh, he was part of the Greek world. Uh, ultimately, he came to Rome, uh, but he uh, would have been originally a Greek speaker. Uh, but he uh, lived, uh, ultimately died uh, in Italy. Um, but he was uh, reviving Plato's thought. And so here we have in the Christian era now, um, a third century AD, we have a philosopher who's a, a pagan philosopher um, who is sort of bringing Plato and Christianity together in a way that a century or so later, St. Augustine, who's a pagan who becomes a Christian, also begins putting these things into the mix. So in some ways, what the Neoplatonists of the third and fourth century were doing uh, was riffing on Christianity and Plato and coming up with a philosophy, which is then recovered uh, uh, many, many uh, a thousand years later by someone like Marsilio Ficino and Pico della Mirandola. Um, and I mean, uh, to put it in its simplest form, what they're doing is looking at Plato's ideas and in some ways, Christianizing them. St. Augustine had by and large done that. Uh, but maybe the simplest way to think of it is that they're looking at the mind versus matter debate. And mind is, is mind over matter for the Platonists and Neoplatonists. But that already seems like quite a Christian idea. And Platonism and Christianity seem like pretty seamless bedfellows in that sense, don't you think? Very much so. Uh, I mean, Plato, in some ways, was controversial in the 1400s, but a thousand years before that, he was seen by people like, such as Saint Augustine as the figure, the pagan philosopher from whom the Christians could take the most information. And Augustine even said that if um, uh, if Plato were alive here in, say, 410 A.D he would uh, be a Christian. He would have converted to Christianity, as I, St. Augustine, did. Um, and so um, there are all sorts of overlaps between Christianity and Platonism. And that's what makes it appealing to someone like Marsilio Ficino um, in the second half of the 1400s, so a thousand years out and plus after Augustine. Plato was controversial in the first half of the 1400s. We think of him as uh, what uh, the philosopher A. N. Whitehead said about a hundred years ago, um, as all philosophy he said is a footnote to Plato, and we think of Plato. Pr Plato was present in many ways at the origins of philosophy. Um, he se he seems quite he seems quite mainstream to us now, but at the time it was that wasn't the case. 
Not at all. Not at all. He, you know, if we went back to the year 1400, they had only four of his um, uh, 36 dialogues translated into Latin. Hence, and why, excess- hence why Ficino's translation of it was such a big deal. That, that's right. Yeah. That, because it suddenly became possible. Um, and so, uh, in, in effect, what uh, there is a dual interest, the piety of uh, the Christians, and, and Michelangelo was a very pious, devout, believing Christian, um, is overlaid with or um, has in it or infused with uh, classical learning, the classical learning of Plato and of Plotinus. And uh, so it's they, they don't see these things as oppositional at all. They're both working towards a truth. I mean, this is what was said about Plato is Plato was working his way philosophically towards the Christian God. And so the idea of the one um, is uh, you know very uh, applicable to or very comparable to the idea of the Christian God, but it's it, but but it's sort of the idea that it's um, uh, materiality itself is bad, and uh, to escape materiality uh, takes knowledge of truth. But in Michelangelo's work, would you say that that's sort of conveyed with a almost like a levity of figuration, like the uh, the more elevated or almost, he almost gives a sense of agility in some some of his figures. That's meant to convey sort of a higher spiritual awareness of the figure. And when you look at figures like the Medici tombs, which are sort of weighed down um, by sort of sensual bodies, they're even more sort of sexualized, like bigger breasts or, um, or you could think of the, the slave sculptures. That's meant to imply a sort of lower form of uh, knowledge of truth. Yes, it. Uh, you know, I think in many ways we can read these things into his work, but I wouldn't want to overemphasize that mm. aspect mm. of it, because in the first place, uh, Michelangelo did not really know Latin. Um, we, we're told even by Condivi that he wasn't that interested in his studies. He did have a good teacher, uh, but I don't think he was that um, intellectually engaged at a kind of uh, the level at which Ficino or Pico della Mirandola was by any means, I think. And also there is the problem. He has patrons uh, who are asking him to do specific things. So he doesn't necessarily have the liberty to infuse his work with Neoplatonism. There is in one of the great Michelangelo scholars of the uh, 20th century, Charles de Tolnay, uh, writes fairly persuasively about the influence of neoplatonism on his work uh, but i'm not necessarily i'm not i think in, in the end it can become a little bit reductive if we try to read uh what michelangelo is doing according to a philosophical tradition in which he had certainly dipped his his foot uh but i don't think it it completely infused him because ultimately christianity the christian story was much more important to him uh, than the the philosophical one of Plato, well, it, but yes, it, it's it, interesting it, to think of those struggling figures as souls trying to have the mystical union with the One or with God. That they're trying, that his prisoners are trying to break out of the um, uh, the, the bonds of the material and the earthly and rise up to a spiritual level, which can only be done on a mystical level. Well. What partly makes me think he was very Neoplatonist is, you know, his whole idea about the sort of sculptural theory of subtraction, the idea that um, he wasn't actually creating anything in sculpting. He was just sort of revealing God's work. And in that sense, one could view his sculptures almost as like the nexus point between the physical world and the divine world. And in that sense, that idea seems to be the sort of apotheosis of Neoplatonism. What do you think? Well, I th- that's a very good interpretation. I think what he's doing is taking, you know, he could look, he's taking something, there's nothing more material than a lump of rock uh, that's come from the, the quarry. And he takes this lump of rock and he begins removing it, reducing it. Uh, reducing its materiality. That, that's right. Uh, yeah. and, and making something spiritual, making something beautiful out of it, making something that people can look at uh, and... Uh, and move into uh, the a spiritual realm. So, what happens next in uh, Michelangelo's early career? Is that the age of fifteen? 
Yes, so he ultimately will strike out on his own. And his the big moment for him comes when he goes to Rome uh, in the, the mid 1490s. And on the one hand, he's appalled by what he sees in Rome because the Pope at this time is the Borgia Pope or the, the second of the, the Borgia Popes, the Alexander VI, who's the father of Cesare Borgia and the father of Lucrezia, these uh, notorious figures. And Alexander was a very worldly figure. Um, he had mistresses. Uh, he uh, uh, it was hardly a very devout character. Um, and Michelangelo was appalled by the, the sort of, uh, uh, I guess, the license and licentiousness that he saw in Rome at this time. And he wrote uh, some very disobliging poems about what it was, what the city was like at that time. However, if he was appalled by the Rome of the present day, he was intrigued by, fascinated by uh, the Rome of the past. And in fact, one of the things he began doing um, it was becoming a, uh, what we would say today, call today a forger or something like that. He began mimicking ancient art forms, sculpting works of art, which could pass off as the authentic ancient Greek or Roman works. Which was which, which would have been a particularly impressive scam to pull because at, at this time, um, well, just in general, the ancient sculptors were seen as being the greatest of all time. And in some, some sense still are, but people like Michelangelo and Bernini. Absolutely. So, I mean, if he can fool you into thinking he has created a first century BC marble sculpture, um, the, the, uh, you know, the, uh, and pull the wool over your eyes that way, he is proving his expertise as an artist. And what he's doing with that is uh, comparing himself uh, with and putting himself in competition against the greatest of the ancient world. And that's what he's doing. And what many artists of the Renaissance have been doing for the previous century is trying to beat the ancient Greeks and Romans at their own day, whether it's at architecture and large scale vaulting, or whether it's verisimilitude in uh, sculpture and painting, things like that, that they're trying to um, absorb what the the best of the ancients and then take it to the next level. So what was the name of the, I remember watching a documentary on that actually, and what was the name of the cardinal who he um, first fooled with that uh, cherub sculpture? There was a- uh, cardinal Riario, Riario, who was a very powerful figure who you mm. shouldn't, uh, yes, you shouldn't wasn't- mess with. No, but wasn't wasn't the situation there that he'd sculpted this cherub in the style of um, Praxiteles or someone, one of the one of the ancient sculptors, and he even did things like he covered it in cow cow dung, buried it, and then pulled it back up to give it this sense that it had aged the the way an ancient sculpture would. Yes, uh, so yes, I mean it was the whole theatrical performance, and incidentally, that performance. I'm not sure if this. Uh, takes us a bit too far ahead of ourselves, but a decade or so later, one of the greatest discoveries of uh, the uh, the 16th century, uh, one of the great sculptural discoveries mm. of all time was made in a vineyard in Rome uh, by uh, a man named Felice de Freddi. In his, he had a little vineyard and he was digging up his vines and his, his spade hit something um, and he began digging, and very quickly they realized this looked to be something very important. And Michelangelo was called along with a few other people, and, and they dug it up, and it was the Le- Leocoon. Did uh, Michelangelo great... actually help dig it up? Yeah, he was present and sort of wow. helped identify. There is a scholar today who argues that it uh, it was a forgery. You can see this work today. It's in pride of place in the Vatican museums. A bloody good and forgery. In, yes. Well, <laughs> in some ways, scholars of Hellenistic art would be happy to say that was a, a Michelangelo sculpture because of the fact that it doesn't match a lot of other Hellenistic art. <clears throat> it's quite Michelangelesque in that sense. Mm. That's right. I'm not sure... <clears throat> I'm not sure I believe that story, um, but it is intriguing. And you can say that Michelangelo had a kind of track record for doing that. Mm, that would be so cool if we found out that he actually had done it. Um, so at the age of 21, Michelangelo receives this, the commission to sculpt the Pietà, um, and he promised that it would be, quote, the most beautiful work in marble that Rome has ever seen, close quote. Um, and I think 
undoubtedly the Pietar is one of the top five or so sculptures in the world. But could you just comment on the precociousness and audacity of Michelangelo at this early stage in his career? Yeah, so, I mean, if we think of this work, which is uh, absolutely stunning, um, it and the fact that he did it at such a young age, uh, in his early 20s, and the, the fact that he would claim that it was going to be something that surpassed all of the ancients shows a certain, uh, a, a certain self-confidence, to say the least, on his part. But what it shows us is uh, this incredibly uh, moving scene of a mother weeping over her son, and it shows us a kind of uh, feminine beauty and also tranquility. Um, so in some ways, this is a, a kind of Hellenistic sculpture, um, if we think of the art of that period in the, the centuries uh, of BCE. Um, and so it's a very uh, beautiful, tranquil, um, but highly, highly detailed work of art. One of the um, interesting things that uh, a, a friend of mine, the great uh, Michelangelo scholar, William Wallace, has speculated is that uh, there are reports that, like Leonardo da Vinci, uh, Michelangelo was left-handed. He was naturally left-handed, uh, but he uh, um, appears to have worked with his uh, written and also painted with his right hand. And so um, Bill Wallace's idea is that Michelangelo was actually ambidextrous. I was going to. I was going to say, was he? Did he paint and write with his right hand because he was forced to, or because he was just naturally amb ambidextrous? I, I think it was naturally, or at least uh, this mm. is Bill Wallace's theory, which I uh, can well believe that he was ambidextrous, which gave him an excess. I I've never sculpted, but I have asked sculptors about this, and they say it would be a huge advantage to have ambidexterity uh, doing that kind of work because you could hit. The hammer with uh, with both hand with either hand and also manipulate the chisel and some of the details that he works in because of the fact that they're um, so uh, I mean what, it's wonderful if you can you can't see the Pietà up close uh, unfortunately but some of the other ones is Florentine Pietà uh, which is in the Museo del, dell'Opera del Duomo in Florence you can get quite close to and you can see just the difficulty the incredible difficulty he would have had working his way into position to strike the blows to knock off the marble, to strike the blow with great precision, force and precision, um, and you know, without, without doing further damage to it. Uh, so it's really remarkable. It's also interesting, I think, because it's the first example we see of Michelangelo being willing to manipulate and distort the anatomy of the figures to fit the narrative of the composition. You see it in the way he sort of enlarges the head of the David um, and how in, in this, the Pietà, uh, isn't it the the figure of uh, Mary would actually be sort of three feet taller or something than the figure of Jesus, but because it wouldn't have worked compositionally otherwise, he had to increase her height. That's right. Uh, she's a, a giantess. Mary is a giantess. If she stood up, she would be um, much, much bigger than Christ. Uh, but of course, what he's not is not concerned about having those sorts of exact proportions. What if she is cradling? It's going to look terrible if uh, uh, you have this small Mary cradling a giant Christ on her lap. Uh, and so we he has to make those sorts of optical adjustments. And he would have learned that by walking around Florence, looking at works of art, public works of art, things that Donatello, for example, had done in the first half of the 1400s, because Donatello was the master of those sorts of optical corrections, because work that he was doing uh, would go up, uh, you know, 10 feet, 12 feet uh, on the side of, uh, the, on the facade of the cathedral, for example, or on Orsan Michele, uh, this uh, building in the center of Florence. And so you were seeing it from ground level and looking up. And so you had to make a kind of optical correction or everything would have looked distorted. And that's why if you look at, if you come eye to eye with some Donatello sculptures and things like that, you think they don't look right. Uh, but once they're in the right position, once you see them from the angle from which Donatello knew you were going to be seeing them from, everything comes right. And you're absolutely right with the David. It was going to be, as far as he knew when it was commissioned, it was going to be 80 feet off the ground on mm. the side of the cathedral. So he had to accentuate 
figures such as the brow and the right hand and so forth. So they were legible from the ground. But at the same time, because I've had a guest on my podcast before and we've discussed precisely that thing um, about why the David is disproportionate and we talked about it being placed, well, it was originally going to be placed on top of the cathedral. But I wonder if, because the large head also suggests that this is um, a adolescent boy, you know, like um, men when they're at, at that age, their head grows quicker than the rest of their body does. And I've... I think that narrative fits better with the David just because I don't think there was debate at the time whilst Michelangelo was sculpting the David where they were going to place it and I don't think he was going to hedge his bets on it being placed up high if if he did have to increase the size of it and then all of a sudden he found that it wasn't going to be placed that high as in fact it wasn't. Um, I think I wonder if it was done for pers- perspectival reasons or to convey the adolescence of David. Uh, very possibly. The, uh, I'm, I'm sure he's very happy as well that it did not go up that high because mm. it would have been very difficult to appreciate. And also, it's interesting to see the detail that he puts into it. If it was, you know, he has cuticles and things like that uh, on uh, uh, on David's fingers and toenails. So, you know, you, you could, of course, never have seen something like that from the uh, if it, it was going to be 80 feet up. But I think also the enlargement of the head, he wants us to see the facial expression because this is not simply uh, a moment of um, uh, a physical uh, 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 a physical accomplishment, the physical deed carried forth by him. Um, it's a uh, it, it's something mental. Uh, David has not just the the help of the Lord, but he's also got his own inner strength. And so when you see that that knit brow and that look of concentration, Michelangelo wanted to get that across, that it's a, a kind of mental act as well as a physical one that allows him to uh, uh, to defeat Goliath. Of course, the great uh, irony of this sculpture is that it was known as Il Gigante. It was known as the giant. And of course, David was not the giant. He was the giant killer, the one who fought them. And of course, his David is very, very different. I think we've lost sight now because it's become so iconic of how odd a, a, how odd an execution this was. What a strange way to tell the story because David was usually shown as, for example, by Andrea del Verrocchio a couple of decades earlier, the man who taught uh, Leonardo da Vinci. He's shown as a slight, as he is in the Bible, as mm-hmm. a very slight, uh, very slender uh, weakling almost uh, who and, and it's emphatically the the help of God uh, that God is the agent who allows him to defeat Goliath and that's almost it, the David's almost his first um, Michelangelesque muscular figure figure as well because I mean if you look at back his uh, sculpture of Bacchus is much closer to Donatello's sculpture of David this live body so it's quite interesting in that sense I was also um I've got this funny theory about the um the size of the David's penis um right, often, yes because much is often made about how small it is and what I you could put in that neoplatonic um idea to it that you know uh he's uh, how you'd convey uh, a lack of carnal desire is by actually you know not emphasizing the genitalia of the figure but I think it's you could almost say that the the size of the penis almost hints at how terrified he is of the giant in front of him. It's literally shriveling him up. But despite that, he's got this steely determination in his face. So it's sort of this ultimate juxtaposition between fear and determination despite that fear. Right. Well, very possibly. The But in other ways, he is cop- he's simply copying the ancient Greeks and Romans because you did not want to have a an emphatic penis or that would obviously Mm. detract from uh detract from the story it would become a different thing would become a kind of priapus or something like that Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh yes they all put it there um the other reason is it would chip off i mean there are many uh statues you see them in the uffizi in florence uh where there's a great collection of ancient statues and that is the vulnerable point the vulnerable point uh, for ancient nude statuary is the nose and the nose penis. and the cock. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. They, they're the first things to go. Yes. Um, just how received, well received was the David? Um, 
did it make Michelangelo an international superstar? And could you also just explain the lead up to that commission, how old he was and a few of the details of it? Sure. Well, he um, got it, the commission, when he was uh, 25 years old. So he had completed the Pietà. And that made him, th- that work really then made him famous. That was done in Rome. That is so wild, though. Like so, some, someone younger than me being able to sculpt the David is just pff, fucking wild. Sorry, go on, though. Go on. And then by the time he's 30, by the time he's 29, uh, he has done the David. So he has in his 20s. And I think, uh, you know, this would be depressing for anyone to think about uh, because he sets the bar so high uh, that by the time he reaches 30, he has done those two works, which do make him, as you suggest, uh, effectively world famous. Um, He... Um, uh, you know, he has this big splash in Rome in St. Peter's. Old, the old Basilica of St. Peter's is where this is, the most important church in the uh, Roman world. Um, the Pietà is there. And then he has in, in, in Florence, ultimately on public display in front of the, uh, the, the most important civic building, what we today call the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence. He has that one, 14 feet high, this block of marble, that no other people had tried to work with, but it was regarded as impossible. It was too big, and also there was a flaw in it. And it was and it was very thin as well, wasn't it? The block. So so any it limits how dynamic your composition can be. That's right. And when we think, I mean, it's very difficult for any of us who are maybe not structural engineers or large scale sculptors or you know people doing sculpture. Uh, in metal and thing like things like that, to consider that of all the other things you have to think of as a, a sculptor, you have to make sure that it will stand up, that it will that it won't tip over, and uh, that it had to have an equilibrium. And he did not have, as you say, because of the shape of this thing, he did not have a lot of leeway to um, uh, uh, not a lot of room for error. Um, he, you know, it had to be counterbalancing itself. Um, and so um, it was a tremendous feat, not just artistically, because there's such a convincing figure and such a beautiful figure, but it was also remarkable because of the fact that it was um, a, a kind of structural feat in its own right. Aside from his early influences uh, at the Academy in Florence, why do you think Michelangelo viewed sculpture as the, the supreme art form? I, it's difficult to know. He he got into a, a fight with Leonardo da Vinci about this. They would argue a, a, about it, um, not directly because they saw each other as little as possible. Uh, they were distrustful of each other, and I personally did not like one another. Uh, Leonardo, of course, was older. He was born in 1452, so he's really another generation. Uh, but uh, the what, one of the things that went on in Milan when... Leonardo da Vinci was there as they would have these kind of oratorical composi- uh, com- competitions where they would argue about which was the best art form. Was it music? Is it architecture? Is it painting? Is it sculpture? And Leonardo, of course, would argue for painting. And his Leonardo's argument is that painting was a much more refined form of working because you could have uh, people in your studio, you could have a, a chamber orchestra playing or something like that, or you could have uh, table uh, 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 table music being played for you, um, and uh, you would uh, could dress up. You could dress in your finery as you went to work. Whereas the the sculptor got was physical, hard physical work, and he got covered in dust and made a racket with his hammer and chisel and everything like that. I think this is there's a lot of joviality to this kind of argument, and it's just sort of trash talking each other. But for Michelangelo, I think ultimately it was the fact that sculpture was three-dimensional and and it was maybe tactile in a way that painting for the most part is not. Um, And you could have maybe more um, uh, encompassing experience of a sculpture because you could walk around it. You could walk around it, David, um, as you can today in uh, the academia and see it from behind. Um, And I think he... uh, I, I suppose, I mean, the fact that he painted as well and Leonardo da Vinci worked in sculpture 
um, indicates that I don't think they, they really believe there were hard and fast rules about um, one of them not being a, a, a worthy art form. Um, well, it's interesting because, so as I was saying to you before, I've just been in London for just a week now and one of the first things I did was go to the National Gallery and I saw the Manchester Madonna by Michelangelo and I've obviously, obviously always held Michelangelo in the highest regard as a painter, but I think there's something about how reproductions of his paintings, they kind of, because they're so polished, they you're not necessarily aware of how technical his brushwork is. They almost come across sort of like quite plasticised or something. Um, but this was the first time that I'd seen a Michelangelo painting up close, obviously been to the Sistine Chapel, but obviously that's like, you know, 60 feet high. Um, and just seeing it up close, I was just amazed by his technical facility as a painter because I'd always viewed Leonardo and Raphael as the more natural painters. Um but in seeing that, especially for how early in his career the Manchester Madonna was, he's sort of he's easily the equal of Leonardo in technical facility. And I thought even greater than Raphael, who I'd, as I said, always seen as the natural painter. So, yeah, remarkable. And I think we can credit Girland Dial for that because Girland Dial was a great craftsman. Um, yeah, I think he was also a very good painter uh, and much underrated because of the fact that, uh, you know, he was exceeded by his pupil who later trash talked him and said that he was not uh, 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 uh he learned nothing from Ghirlandaio was Michelangelo's official story but Ghirlandaio was a brilliant draftsman and as Leonardo, uh, as uh, Michelangelo became um, and so I th I think he did learn um the, the certainly the the basics extremely well from Ghirlandaio he probably would have learned from anyone but Ghirlandaio was as good a, a teacher as you could have and so I think when we look at the technical competence that he has in painting, a good part of that goes back to the, when he is a young adolescent in the studio of Domenico learning mm. his trade. And in fact, they had one of Gil and Dyer's works right next to it as well, um, probably to actually show that comparison. Um, is the Battle of Kashina the greatest work of art that was never created? Ah, well... Uh, quite possibly, if it wasn't, the it, its competition for that title is the one that was going to be painted on the opposite wall, or possibly even on the same wall. We're not ex exactly sure uh, where it was going to be, but yes, uh, this th these are the the two works that Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo were going to paint in what we call the Palazzo Vecchio today, the um, the the government house in Florence, the seat of government in the audience hall, in effectively the, the House of Commons of, the, uh, uh, of Florence. Uh, and what we got then in 1503, 1504, uh, were two artists at the height, two sons of Florence, the most famous painters in the world at that point, or most famous artists in the world, I should say, at that of point. on as well, you could even yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. Yes coming together i mean a, a master stroke of the florentines to decide we've got leonardo back in the city spent almost 20 years in milan in the last three years of which he painted the last supper and we've now got michelangelo who has not uh, just done the pieta in rome but he has just finished the david here in florence and so let's bring them together and put them into competition head to head against one another um, to in a kind of uh, great Florentine bake-off or something like that to have uh, see who can do the best painting on the wall. And so they're, they're each given uh, a topic, a battle scene uh, to, uh, 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 to paint. And as you say, it, uh, it neither, neither came off, neither was finished. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci appears, he started his a little bit earlier. Um, his was commissioned first. And he did work on it for a year or two at least, and might and certainly progressed onto the wall and began painting, uh, but was using what appears to have been a kind of experimental technique, even experimental beyond what he did on the walls of Santa Maria delle Grazie in Milan, which was its own kind of experiment, um, in many ways a failed experiment technically, uh, because of the way that it's peeling off or has been peeling off for the last 500 years. Um, and but ultimately he left and went to Milan and uh, didn't come back and finish it and ultimately was painted over. 
Um, Michelangelo didn't even get that far. He didn't put a single lick of paint on the wall because of course he had just started, he'd begun making his designs uh, for it, doing his drawings for it um, and think of how he's going to tackle it when suddenly his phone rings and it's the Pope who says, Pope Julius II, who's been bon elected. <laughs> yes, so, yes. And, and, and so you, you can't refuse his call. Um, and so, and what the Pope wants is come to Rome. I got elected a year earlier, a year and a bit earlier, uh, come and do my tomb. Uh, and so that is, for the time being, the end of Michelangelo's career in Florence. So what you were saying as well about the rivalry between Leonardo and Michelangelo, I've often wondered that perhaps part of the reason why there was so much good art from this period was because there was this sense of competition between artists, which in hindsight kind of seems a bit ridiculous, the idea of, you know, fanciful artists being, you know, like Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali. Um, and you get that. I was also reading, I read your book a couple of years ago, The Judgment of Paris as well, and you definitely get that sense in the salon room uh, in Paris at the time. You don't really seem to get that in a lot of contemporary art today. I mean, art criticism and artists themselves seem a lot sort of nicer to each other than uh, perhaps they were in these times. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I do think that's right. Um, but it, I think it comes, well, I hope it's true in that there aren't uh, the sort of um, bitter rivalries that uh, they, they had back in the Renaissance. But you get such good art from it. Well, I, I suppose that that you can say that it did produce results. You can argue with the results of it. In many ways, these competitions were set up by the patrons. And it, it makes a lot of sense to, if you want uh, to get things done in a timely fashion and you want to get the best out of your artists, put them in competition with each other. Um, and, uh, uh, and a lot of good came out of that. So, and, and in some ways, these were friendly rivalries as well, not with, uh, not in any case with anyone Michelangelo went up uh, against. But in the case of Donatello, for example, he, in one of the first great competitions is in the early 1400s when the Cathedral of Florence has four, four big blocks of marble and they want the four evangelists sculpted for the facade of the cathedral and they choose three good young painters, one of whom is Donatello. And they tell these three painters, here's your block of marble and we'll, we're going to have a competition and whoever we choose as the winner gets block number four. And so you get to have two pieces of your work on the cathedral and that sort of prestige. Um, and of course, uh, you uh, go on and get these wonderful works of art by Nanni Di Banco and, uh, and Donatello and so forth. And this really then continues through the 1400s and into the 1500s. I mean, something like fresco really did become a competitive sport in uh, Florence and uh, Milan as well uh, at this time. So it was just a way of, of I think, maximizing the efforts of mm. the artists who were working for you. Do you think that the Battle of Kashina is the first example we see of dense, heavily populated compositions from Michelangelo? Because in my mind, it seems to almost foreshadow the um, Last Judgment. And you have all these figures depicted in the very moment of a sort of cataclysmic event. And there's certainly that sense of sort of ascent from some figures and descent from others. Yeah, it. I wouldn't say it's the first because say 10 plus years before that, when he was basically just a kid, he did the Battle of the Centaurs. Um, which is one of the, I was talking about Politian, Poliziano earlier. Um, he uh, uh, is the one supposedly, according to legend, who suggested the theme to Michelangelo. Um, and a lot of things, uh, we see a lot of these themes recurring in Michelangelo, things that maybe uh, were instilled in him by someone like Politian, but also uh, I think they naturally came to him. And what we have in the Battle of the Centaurs and again, in the Battle of Kashina is this, um, uh, uh, these struggling figures, these dense struggling figures packed together where we, this could, is a kind of earthly struggle that if we do want to accept the influence of Neoplatonism is the breaking three of the earth, earth, earthiness, the materiality of a centaur and going on to become something else. But isn't that almost the nature of relief sculpture that it's always going to be densely populated as opposed to, you know, in painting, you, you're not constrained in that way. 
To some extent, yes, but Donatello uh, did in, in uh, Santa Croce, the great uh, Franciscan Basilica in Florence, he has a Madonna and child um, in uh, relief sculpture, which is not uh, uh, heavily packed. Uh, it's just, the, just the, the two of them. Um, and also things like um, beneath his St. George, the image of St. George killing the dragon that he did for Orsan Michele, again, is just Mm. Uh, we have a landscape background. We have St. George on horseback with his lance and the dragon. So it's, I guess, if, if Michelangelo walked around looking at pulpits in, in Florence, in Siena, uh, in Pisa and places like that, he would have seen densely packed low relief sculpture. But I would say that his um, his approach to it was different because someone like, and when I talk about the pulpits, I'm, uh, talking about uh, uh, Nicola and uh, Giovanni Pisano, uh, because uh, what they were doing was uh, creating these uh, uh, quite high relief uh, sculptural panels, which then, uh, which are Christian scenes and do not necessarily have that sort of kinetic energy and then the naked struggle, the literally naked struggle uh, that we get in Michelangelo. So he sort of riffs on them but brings his own idea of materiality uh, and spirituality into it. Compositionally, do you think Michelangelo painted like a sculptor in the sense that the human form always holds complete primacy in his paintings? There seems to be very little emphasis on the landscape and spatial depth in his paintings. Yes, I, I would say that's absolutely the case, uh, but with one caveat. But I'll, I'll uh, first say absolutely yes, that is true because of the fact that the human body is the the object that he works on to tell whatever story he wants to tell. Um, he does not need to bring in a lot of architecture. He doesn't need to bring in a landscape. He paid no attention whatsoever to landscape. I mean, if there's the possibility in the creation of Adam, for example, to show, you know, what does the background of paradise look like? And for Michelangelo, it's basically a wasteland, a featureless wasteland. Um, and so, and, and he spoke disparagingly of landscape painting, landscape background paintings as something that was simply entertaining to children, women, and Flemish artists. He had absolutely no truck with it himself because it is the primacy of the human figure. However, and j just the caveat I spoke about is for a long time until really the 1980s, for many decades, if not centuries before the 1980s and 1990s, what people would say about Michelangelo is he painted like a sculptor, did not use color um, and used a lot of shadow and things like that in his painting. However, in the 1980s, they began cleaning the vault of the Sistine Chapel and discovered that these coruscating, beautiful uh, uh, colors of shot silk and things like that. And a lot of academics who had made their career saying that uh, Michelangelo was not a colorist, he didn't know anything about color, and basically he painted in black and white, either had to, as some of them, to their credit, did reevaluate it and said, wow, this is amazing that uh, he actually painted like this and it's wonderful we're learning this, or like some others uh, who were not quite so gracious said that well, in fact, uh, he didn't actually paint in those bright colors, or if he did, he painted over them in black and white and muted them down. Uh, so those academics must have been the um, those academics must have been the only ones protesting the Japanese restoration team in the eighties, I imagine. And they did protest it. There, were, it was very controversial, and uh, it uh, yes, it was a, a, a very hard fought. But I think in the end, it's now seen as having been a, a very good restoration, which took it back to what it would have looked like if we were lucky enough to be in the Sistine Chapel uh, when it was unveiled in 1512. It improved your book cover, that's for sure. That's right. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, you can tell if uh, photographs of the Sistine Chapel were taken before or after the re restoration, whether they're these muddy things uh, in which there's no bright colors, or uh, if you do get these wonderful colors of shot silk, I mean, these beautiful colors blending into one another. And again, you talk about Manchester Madonna. This is a, a mm. demonstration of just how adept he was as a painter. 
He's working in this case in fresco, which we'll probably talk about, um, a very, very difficult medium. Uh, and yet he's able to bring uh, these eye popping colors out of the plaster. Of, um, and back to what we were saying as well about everything being implied in the human form. The entire story is always suggested by the figure in Michelangelo's works. I've always resented just the phrase conceptual art, especially when it's seen as antithetical to what people call, you know, traditional art like Michelangelo's because do you get anything more conceptual than the David, for example? It's like everything about the story isn't actually there. It's all implied by the figuration and how, how he sculpts the figure. Right. I mean, I mean, he every every I assume every artist ha, is a conceptual artist because yeah, every exactly. artist has to have a if you don't have a concept, I don't think you should be painting or sculpting. I think, um, you know, unless your concept is that you don't have a concept, which is, might be an interesting way to approach something. I think, yes, everyone has um, uh, this is the I what they called it in Michelangelo's day was disegno it was this art of design that was your concept uh, that you uh is something that you designed intellectually and then worked on physically so up to this stage Michelangelo's done very few paintings which is what makes his accomplishment in the Sistine Chapel uh so remarkable but I've always viewed drawing as the equivalent of sort of going to the gym for an athlete. I feel if one is competent as a draftsman, he or she can quite quickly become competent at any other medium, whether that be sculpting, painting or whatever. Do you think that Michelangelo's supreme competency as a draftsman is what allowed him to master so many art forms, such as architecture, painting, um, engineering? Yes, without doubt. He... um that well in, in many ways this i this concept of drafting drawing and design uh, begins with him and ultimately makes its way into the art academies of later centuries uh, for, for example if you went to the ecole de beaux-arts in paris uh, you would have a pencil for and charcoal for the first two or three years of study you would not pick up a paintbrush until year three or four because you had to, first of all, learn the art of design. And that's what uh, Michelangelo was a master at. Um, he was a beneficiary of the fact that he lived in a century uh, when paper was much more widely available than it would have been, uh, say, 200 years earlier to someone like Giotto, who uh, could not uh, have had as much access to this raw material for thinking out your, thinking out your work physically, putting it down quite literally on paper. Um, and so uh, he and uh, Leonardo da Vinci were the beneficiaries of the fact that paper was being manufactured en masse in Italy, quite close to Florence, in fact, at Prato at this time, um, and uh, working on it. So yes, ultimately, he was a designer. And that, you can say that about all of the great artists of the 14 and 1500s. They learned the art of design, first of all, how to engineer something from uh, idea, from the concept of it to the, the finished product. And so it becomes an intellectual exercise uh, that you think out on paper, and then you bring to fruition, whether it's in uh, marble or in on fresco on a 30 foot wide wall, or whether it's on a four foot wide altarpiece. So um, it's these talents, these, they're not necessarily different skill sets. They're all related. Mm. And I mean, I suppose an interesting th to thing to think about is what we have. We have the idea of the universal artist in the 1400s and 1500s, someone who can work. Michelangelo was said to reign supreme in architecture, um, painting and sculpture. And some people would have added poetry to that as well. Leonardo da Vinci likewise worked in various media, as did Frangelico, who did uh, manuscript illustration as well as altarpieces, as well as frescoes. And I guess one thing to ask about today is what artists, um, are there artists who work in different media, who work in sculpture and who work in film and who work in, uh, who are great, uh, a, a great draftsmen uh, and things like that. And, um, um, you know, or is that something that we still retain or do you stick to one particular medium and uh, gain your expertise in it. 
Yeah, they're very few, few and far between people like that today. And it was interesting what you were saying about um, how you had to, you wouldn't touch a paintbrush for years uh, under your apprenticeship in the Renaissance because um, a few art courses that I did when I was younger, it would be painting um, and it wouldn't be drawing, but we wouldn't be allowed to use colour um, until a certain stage. And I guess painting in black and white is sort of the equivalent of drawing. Um, and yeah, I wonder if it's sort of, I also wonder if it's kind of like colour is a hard thing to master, not as hard as drawing, but I also it, it can very easily ruin a picture and I wonder if it's almost seen as sort of like discouraging or it would have even been in the Renaissance just because of how expensive pigments were. I can imagine that they didn't want to waste their good pigments on people who weren't going to make good pictures from them. Yes, uh, there's that sort of practical economic reality of learning how to paint. Um, also, there was a suspicion of bright colors, especially somewhere like Florence, uh, that uh, that was being too showy and you're being too gaudy. And Venetian. what was, yes, exactly. And it was the big debate that they had in the 1500s between color and design. And if we want to split them into camps, the Florentines are design. And so they're the ones, the black and white, the drawing, uh, the refinement of. Uh, th that technique and the Venetians, the, according to the, the Florentines, at least are these flashy uh, people who have used very bright colors to attract attention. And, and there's, that, there's, there's that famous anecdote of when Michelangelo meets Titian and he says that if Titian had concerned himself with anatomical accuracy earlier in his career, he would have been as great as he was. Yes. And, it, and you, I mean, that is a, a rare sort of compliment, as usual, a kind of backhanded compliment. The nicest thing he ever said about another artist, I think. Exactly. Um, but it, yeah, and then there might be some truth to that because he, you could, Titian, I suppose, doesn't have the sort of discipline of form that someone like uh, Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci or Ghirlandaio or people like that had. But he was looking for different effects. And so, mm. but these were effects that the Florentines um, were perhaps striving for uh, in a, a much more modest way. So, the sort of climax of your book here, so I've got my copy from 10 years ago or so, um, is the Sistine Ceiling Commission. Uh, what were the events that led to that commission? And just for the listeners, could you describe the challenges Michelangelo faced with the ceiling? How many square feet was it? And um, also, what were the perspectival challenges he faced? Sure. There were all sorts of challenges. And he was not the person you would have thought in when it was first mooted in 1506, um, just after, say, a year after he came to Rome. Uh, you would not have said that Michelangelo was in any way, shape or form the man for the job. Uh, because of the fact that he originally came, as I was saying, to do the tomb of Julius, uh, which was going to be this massive, it was going to be the biggest uh, tomb built for anyone since the Emperor Augustus in uh, the early uh, yeah, early first century. Um, and it, it was going to be 50 feet high, it was going to have 40 or 50 life-size or over-life-size figures and so forth. It, would have, it was going to be 100 tons of marble, uh, that uh, Michelangelo would have spent the rest of his life working on. Uh, but he had just really got ready to make a start on this huge project, which was really his dream commission. He would, could not wait to get going on it um, because it was going to allow him to do all of these David-like figures. He was going to do 40 Davids and put them onto the sculpture, uh, this sculptural ensemble. Uh, but of course, in 1506, he found out that Julius was not going to proceed with it. Julius suddenly says, stop, I'm not going to have you do the tomb. Uh, could you because also, of the fact just, just uh, to give a bit more context as well, could you describe the character of Pope Julius II and why it's so sort of interesting in the lead up to this commission? Exactly. Um, he uh, Well, he was known as Il Papa Terribile, the terrifying Pope. Uh, he was someone who inspired awe, fear and, and often hatred. Um, in the people that he met. He was incredibly overbearing. He was a type A personality, you know, very much larger than life, uh, extremely intimidating, uh, single-minded, in many ways not a bad pope for the time because he had to uh, be very aggressive against the 
um, uh, you know, the various predatory neighbors who were gobbling up bits of the papal states because the popes ruled over as many as a million people um, in uh, through central Italy, north from Rome. Um, and uh, he needed to get the tax money to put the church back on better footing. So he became known as the warrior pope because of the fact that he, he went off and led military expeditions against renegade cities such as Perugia and Bologna. Uh, and so, uh, yes, he uh, is, becomes Michelangelo's patron. And it's a good combination in a way. Obviously, sparks are going to fly when you get these two extremely self-confident, uh, irascible, uh, hot-tempered characters coming together. But when Julius tells Michelangelo he's not going to do the tomb, Michelangelo is extremely upset uh, because his dream com commission is taken away from him. And he's told that instead, what he's going to have to do is paint the vault of the Sistine Chapel. Um, the Sistine Chapel was constructed in uh, the 1470s uh, for Pope Sixtus IV, which is where we get the term Sistine from, for the Sistine Chapel. Uh, and it suffered uh, some structural damage in the early 1500s, uh, which caused the plaster to come down from the ceiling. So it needed to be repainted. Julius owed a lot to his uncle Sixtus, and he therefore couldn't abide the fact that uh, there was uh, this uh, sort of crumbling rubble on the ceiling of uh, the chapel of his, his beloved uncle's name. And so he told Michelangelo, you need to get up on a scaffold and do me a painting up there. You're not going to do your dream commission of the sculpture. You're going to have to paint 12,000 square feet. So it's, it's an enormous uh, space. And it's also a very awkward space, not just to paint, because he's going to have to uh, be painting above his head, standing on a scaffold. They, unlike Charlton Heston, poor Charlton Heston, in the agony and the ecstasy, he did not lie on his back. He could stand up, as he clearly describes. He stood up on the, the scaffold, head tipped back, arm raised above his head, painting. So it's physically awkward, but it's also awkward because of the fact that it has to be seen from say, 100 feet below. And so it's not going to be very legible. And also, uh, the good space in the Sistine Chapel, the prime locations, the walls, which is what generally attract all the attention, were painted by people, including his old teacher, with whom he fell out, apparently, Domenico Ghirlandaio. And so he's brought really into competition with the ghost of Ghirlandaio, who died just over 10 years earlier. Um, but uh, And also Pietro Perugino, another painter from an older generation, who he also had fallen out with. And so uh, he, uh, this kind of unfair competition is being set up whereby Michelangelo gets the, uh, the rubbish space in the chapel to paint. Um, and he is not a frescoist. He has not worked in fresco at this point. If, you know, if we think he left Ghirlandaio studio, perhaps as early as 1489, it's now 1506. That's a, a big period during which he's not really picked up a paintbrush apart from the fact that a couple of years earlier in say 1504 he painted the Donitondo this very beautiful but very small painting um, in now in the Uffizi there's which only, is not in fresco there's only three paintings that he that we know of anyway that he completes prior to this commission isn't there that's just but that's just wild it's like not not only is it 12,000 square feet but it's arguably the greatest work in painting ever and he does it with such little experience not just in fresco but fresco is much harder as you rely in the book than uh, oil painting but it's just bizarre now look upon it uh, uh, you know quite rightly as such an icon and it's and and michelangelo is such a genius so it's very tempting for us to think of course he was going to be successful at it he was michelangelo he knew what he was doing but in fact in 1506 or rather in 1508, when he finally decided he couldn't get out of doing it and he had to do it. And so he began painting in the summer of 1508. Um, uh, there, there was no guarantee that he was going to make a success of it. In fact, if you were to lay bets at that time, you would expect him not to make a success of it, maybe not to finish it, uh, because of the fact that he did not have the skills required, the technical skills required to do it, because fresco is logistically the most difficult of all forms of painting. It's not simply, if you're asked to paint a fresco, 
this is you're not going to be working with oil paint on a dry wall and simply doing a mural, which is more or less what Leonardo da Vinci did when he painted The Last Supper. Um, but that's why The Last Supper is in such bad condition. Um, what uh, you did with fresco was you took your um, pigments, water-based pigments, um, and painted on wet plaster. So what would happen is you would turn up um, at the Sistine Chapel or wherever you were painting at uh, eight o'clock in the morning, and you would hope that your plasterer had turned up at seven o'clock in the morning and covered maybe five square feet, 10 square feet with wet plaster, what was known as the intonico, this lime plaster. And you then as a painter or as painters, because it was always done in a team, because there, there was, you needed so many hands to get everything ready for this, you would begin painting at uh, eight o'clock. And you then had until maybe four in the afternoon, five, six p.m., depending on the weather, to get to add your water-based pigments, you painted in watercolor, to get them onto the wall before that plaster hardened and dried. And and so the paint doesn't sit on the surface. It becomes sort of subsumed with the plaster and that sort of partly why it's seen as so impressive because it almost has the same permanence as sculpture does. It's going to be there forever. That's right. Mm. Yeah, that's right. It's it, What you get is this chemical combination um, in which you get the calcium hydroxide from the lime mortar reacting with the carbon dioxide in the, the atmosphere to give you calcium carbonate, which is, you know, seashells and things like that are largely cal calcium carbonate. So it, this chemical transformation makes it essentially into a, a kind of rock. And you get this vitreous surface on uh, the, uh, the wall or vault, wherever you're painting. And it's extremely durable because it becomes chemically effectively, it becomes part of the wall. And so it's not, if you paint an altarpiece, you uh, have paint on a wooden surface, a wooden surface that, that has had gesso, a kind of plaster added to it. But you draw, you add it once that gesso is dry. And so you can, which is why you could scrape the pigment off. You can't really, you can't scrape down a fresco because the fresco is really in, you know, in many ways in the rock, it becomes part of the wall. If you want to remove it, and this is the difficult thing, if you realize, oops, I don't like what I did yesterday, or I don't like what I did last week, it doesn't look right. You can't scrape it down as you could do with an altarpiece. Uh, you had to get out your hammer and go at it and knock, uh, chip effectively, chip off the plaster, replaster and repaint. So and it was something that the beauty of it um, uh, was that it was it was in many ways permanent, extremely durable, which is why someone like Giotto, who is a master of it, those works are now 700 years old and they're still in beautiful condition. If you've been in the Scrovegni Chapel mm. or somewhere like that, you can see how well it weathers. Um, and they and they survived. They survived a period of history that didn't have the same culture of uh, restoration that we have as well. Um, as you relay in the book, though, fresco has its origins in Crete and was then used by the Etruscans and the Romans. Do you think that as a medium, fresco was so revered in the Renaissance because it was seen as having come from the same time in history that the Renaissance artists themselves were trying to emulate? It makes sense to say that, and I think that probably in in a lot of ways is true. But the problem with the the reason why it's difficult to argue that too strongly is we just don't know how much of that work they saw. We have much more thanks to archaeological excavations and thanks to Pompeii and Herculaneum, the excavation them. We can see far, far more Roman statuary uh, and also Etruscan, uh, sorry, not Roman statuary, ro uh, Roman painting, Roman wall painting, which was done in fresco. Um, and Etruscan also, um, much of which is older than the, the Roman one, certainly older than Pompeii. We can see far more of this than Michelangelo and his contemporaries were able to. They seem to have known that this was the way in which the ancients painted their walls. And they had, I suppose, as a resource uh, to tell them how to do it and that it was done. Someone like Pliny the Elder, who in his natural history, um, which was written in the first century um, AD, Pliny is the one who died at the eruption of Vesuvius in 79 AD when he uh, rushed off to 
um, to rescue. He was interested in seeing the eruption, but he rushed off to rescue people as well. He was a naval commander. He right. left descriptions. And so they sort of knew that the ancients had done this. And I think you're right, the prestige of it, the fact that so much of what they were doing in the Renaissance was recovering the art forms and the ideology of the ancient Greeks and Romans. So what was good for the ancient Greeks and Romans to decorate their internal rooms was also going to be good for them. But how did they know the chemical combination necessary for making fresco? <laughs> good, good question. Um, it, uh, it's, I suppose, through a kind of trial and error, which long predates Michelangelo. For the most point, for the most part, by the time we reach him, the technique has been perfected. If you go back two centuries before him, two centuries and a bit, we come to the first great frescoists of the, uh, the, the I guess, the modern era, we could say, people um, like Cimabue working in Assisi, and whoever those other artists, including Giotto, were working in Assisi in the late 1200s, early 1300s. And you just have to look at some of the work that Cimabue did in Assisi to realize they were still feeling their way forward in the medium because of the fact that he didn't realize that some of his pigments would react badly to the lime and it would invert the colors. And so uh, you see a lot of discoloring in Chimabue's. Um, and so they were just uh, learning it at that time. And so they must have made small scale experiments. They certainly wouldn't have known, you know, calcium hydroxide and uh, calcium carbonate and, and any technical terms like that. But they seem to have realized that if we get this mixture, this right mixture of lime plaster, and we add our pigments to it, they're going to be frozen in that plaster. And this is therefore a very effective way to decorate an internal room. It, one of the reasons why we don't have this happening in other places in Northern Germany, for example, or in France, is the climate's not right for it. The Italian climate is perfect for it, or at least the climate of Florence, Rome, Naples, less so Milan. Uh, the farther north you go, the, f the farther colder and wetter it gets um, in Europe, the, the least um, uh, uh, adaptable this form is to their walls and vaults. And could you explain why it's such a seasonal art form and why it's so dependent on the weather? Well, <laughs> Michelangelo found out to his cost that it's best done uh, in the summer months when the weather is quite good because he began uh, it, some of his designs um, in the, and uh, seems physically to have begun, begun painting in the late autumn winter of 1508, 1509, which was a bad winter. It was cold and wet in Rome. Um, and the, uh, what you need is your plaster to dry very quickly um, because you know, within that eight, 10, 12 hours to lock the pigments in. Otherwise, you get things happening like, uh, I mean, damp is bad for any plaster, it will cause the plaster to blow, or you'll get mildew, or you'll get what, which is what happened to Michelangelo and efflorescence of salt and things like that. So you need it to dry quickly. So it's best done like wars in, uh, in the summer months when uh, you know, they had their campaigning season, which was in the summer, and that was also the fresco season. But Michelangelo, I think, determined to finish this, decided he would try to work through the winter. And as I described in my book, he ran into all sorts of technical problems precisely because of that. And was it six months' work that he had to go back and change? It probably wasn't six months' worth, but it was certainly quite a few weeks. Oh, um, right. If you um, look at the uh, uh, vault of the Sistine Chapel, you look at images. The first one that he painted was Noah's Flood. And I think he tackled that because it was one that is a subject that in some ways you could say he'd been preparing for with the Battle of the Centaurs mm. and with the Battle of Kashina, um, and that uh, these struggling, naked, struggling figures massed together. It was a very dramatic scene. Um, but I think he, uh, it, in many ways, he should have started with some something simpler because he ran into all sorts of, I think, compositional problems um, one of the th one of the problems he had is he could not step back and look at it because he would fall off the scaffold and he couldn't see it from the ground because of the fact that his scaffold took up you know much of the ceiling and so he couldn't 
see what it was going to look like from the floor, which must have been incredibly intimidating that he's working up there, almost working blind. He doesn't know what it's going to look like. The painters who worked on the wall could step back and they could stand on the floor and look up and see what they were painting. He did not have that luxury. So he was at a huge disadvantage. You would get a sense of the scale, though, from the cartoon designs. So, like, I'm, I'm sure when he when he finished the cartoon design, he could have just put that on a wall, stood 60 feet back, the equivalent of the height of the Sistine ceiling, and got an idea. But, no, I, I still understand it would have would have been very, very difficult to do. I also wonder whether he chose to sort of emulate the same figuration that he'd done in the Battle of Kashina just because he'd never had the opportunity to actually do the Battle of Kashina and because it was so revered and everyone was like, these are the most sophisticated figures that had been painted up to that stage, may as well look for an opportunity to use this, that similar sort of contrapposto and composition. Yes, w- without doubt. that This is his... Uh, the the work of art he was going to do in Florence that was denied to him by being summoned to Rome to do the tomb. He's now going to effect on the vault of the Sistine Chapel. So it re- really is the realization of that project um, mm-hmm. at, with you know, one of his favorite motifs in it, which is the struggling naked human form. That might have even been part of the incentive for him switching from the commission of the tomb to the Sistine scene. I was like, well, at least now I'll get an opportunity to uh, do this previous commission that I've been working on. Um, would the would the cartoon designs for the Sistine ceiling be broken down into sections the size of each intonaco? Because I imagine the plaster, if you applied the whole cartoon design for each, each section, the plaster would dry before the artist could get to it because he could only do a jornata every, every day. That, that's right. Um, he... Sadly, we don't have a lot of his drawings for the Sistine Vault, uh, but he would have done literally thousands of them because he would have first made small compositional drawings. What is the uh, Noah's Flood going to look like? He would have had to figure out where on the panel, that where on the lower part of the ceiling, he was going to put the ark, where he was going to have land that people are huddled on, where the water is going to be and so forth. He would have needed this overall composition. And then he would have had to make all sorts of decisions about what the figures were going to be look like, what they were going to look like, what they were going to be doing. And so he would have made individual drawings for, if not each of them, he would have made drawings of the groups. And then finally, he would have worked up what you're describing, which is the the final cartoon. But because of the fact that these are, many of these figures are life size, it's going to take time for him and his assistants who are going to be helping him, time for him to paint them. And as you point out, he can't necessarily finish the entire, well, in, we know for a fact, he never finished the um, uh, entire panel in a single day. That's impossible. Um, and so he would have cut up the cartoons, which is why cartoons almost never survive from this period. Uh, we do have one of Raphael's for the School of Athens from exactly this period that survives, but it was obviously a cartoon made of the cartoon. It was a duplicate because of course, what you did with your cartoon um, and you know, we uh, from uh, the, the word comes from uh, cartone or from carta is paper. So cartone is big paper or um, in Italian, it now means cardboard, but um, it uh, would have been, um, you know, the thick paper, large piece of paper, pasted together pieces of paper that he would, place up onto the wall, na- literally nail into the vault, um, lay it flat on it, and then transfer his design uh, from that piece of paper to the wet plaster by means of pouncing, i.e. pricking the outlines of it, pricking his design, the charcoal drawing that he made, um, and then hitting the, the, the paper with a, a pounce bag, this little bag that charcoal would come out of, so that when he ripped off his, um, you know, after an hour or so, he would rip off the, uh, the the piece of paper, the cartoon, and he would have an outline in little dots of charcoal, what he had drawn on the paper. Um, and so he would then uh, get his brush out and maybe touch it up and then start painting. But of course, he the paper would have been damaged. It was nailed to wet plaster. It would have come off and it would have been crumbled up and thrown away. So we don't have examples of these. 
um, because they were perishable. They're never meant to survive. As you rely in the book, uh, Bramante, the chief architect of Pope Julius II, was very instrumental in uh, sort of manoeuvring the commission away from the tomb to the Sistine ceiling. And um, so Bramante was, <clears throat> as you obviously know, um, a friend of Raphael and in that sense almost a natural professional enemy of Michelangelo's. But do you think Bramante really was trying to embarrass Michelangelo by pushing him towards the Sistine ceiling because he thought he wouldn't be able to be able to do it? Or was that just sort of Michelangelo being typically paranoid and tempestuous? That, that was his paranoia. I mean, that was what he seems genuinely to have believed against other evidence. But he, yes, he believed that um, Bramante did not want him to succeed as uh, an artist, which there might have been some truth in that, a kind of professional jealousy, rivalry on the part of Bramante, um, who was the chief papal architect, a very powerful figure, very talented figure. And it was maybe natural he would come into conflict with a Florentine, someone who came from a, a different kind of faction in Rome. There was the Urbino faction led by Bramante and the Florentine faction led by Michelangelo's friend, and mentor Antonio da Sangallo, who had been chief papal architect, but who had been displaced by Bramante. And so there's sort of ill will between these two groups uh, who were fighting for papal patronage, of course, um, in Rome. So Bramante may have been trying to spike Michelangelo's guns to some extent, but not to the extent that Michelangelo believed. Uh, Michelangelo believed that Bramante was the one who said, make him paint the vault of the Sistine Chapel, knowing full well that Michelangelo would not succeed at it, which, as I've been saying, was a real possibility. Other evidence, though, is that uh, Michelangelo or Bramante, in fact, advised the Pope against giving Michelangelo the job of painting because he said, Your Holiness, he can't do it. He's not going to be able to do it because of the fact that he doesn't know how to paint di sotto in su from below upwards, which was true. If you were working on a vault, you had to be able to do the sort of optical corrections that we've been talking about, uh, whereby you make uh, uh, these adjustments to the proportions and the scale of the figure and his or her various uh, structural members in order to make it look realistic from a certain angle on the ground. He had no experience doing that. And so Bramante, who had worked in fresco, knew whereof he spoke and quite reasonably pointed out that maybe Michelangelo isn't the man for the job. So Bramante isn't actually the villain that Michelangelo made him out to be. But he, he always needed a villain, someone to, uh, to, to blame if things were going to go wrong. And I think uh, Bramante would have been more scared of uh, Il Papa Terrible and upsetting him with a, with a bad recommendation than he would have been keen to embarrass Michelangelo by giving him a bad commission. I think like if, if the Sistine ceiling had failed, Bramante would have been quite scared of Pope Julius II's reaction. So how does Raphael enter the story of Michelangelo's life? And could you just speak to the relationship between the two artists? What did they think of one another um, and what did they learn from one another? Sure. So, well, if, I mean, we have this kind of succession of great painters, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Raphael, and they're all spaced out a little bit from each other. And, and so our, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, born in 1452, so he's a generation older than uh, Michelangelo. But Raphael was born in 1483, eight years younger than Michelangelo. So Michelangelo is a young prodigy, as we've been talking about, but now along comes someone else who is also a prodigy, a, the boy wonder of Italian painting at this point. Um, he's, so he's a, a very young guy in his 20s, and he turns up in Rome after he's worked in places. He's from Urbino. He's from Bramante's hometown. He may even have been a kinsman of Bramante. Bramante might have been uh, some sort of uncle to him. Uh, that was certainly said at the time. No one's been able able to prove it, but Urbino was a small place. They easily could have been related. And certainly Bramante was going to forward people from his hometown and give them a kind of patronage. Um, he then worked in Perugia. Raphael had with uh, Pietro Perugino. He'd come to Florence. He got to know Leonardo da Vinci, who seems to have given him access to some of the works that he was working on. And he had learned from him. And he now arrives in Rome, mid-20s, extremely ambitious, looking for 
for patronage, looking for looking to do create a, a sort of work of fame, something that's really going to make his name. And from his entree, obviously, was Bramante, who seems to have taken him under his wing um, and helped him get work next, almost literally next door to the Sistine Chapel, which is in the Vatican apartments, in what we now call uh, the uh, Raphael apartments in the Vatican, uh, which were uh, was the Pope's residence. The Pope Julius moved uh, up to the third floor of the, the Vatican apartments and decided to get the decorators in. So he had Bermonte put together a very talented team of painters, which included Pietro Perugino. Uh, and they began work. And then Raphael turned up and um, uh, very quickly um, impressed the Pope so much that Julius gave him overall control, made him the number one painter on this team working in the Vatican apartments. And so if you've been to the Sistine Chapel, if you've been to St. Peter's and uh, gone through the Vatican museums, you know that you walk through the Raphael apartments and to get to the Sistine Chapel is one point where you look out the window um, and you see the Sistine Chapel. And so you can see physically how close those two places were. And so what we get then between say 1508 and 1512 are these two great painters, Raphael and Michelangelo, working on commissions, working on frescoes within a few feet of one another, working on these two of the greatest fresco cycles in the, the history of Western art. And they're being worked on by two guys who absolutely hate each other, or at least Michelangelo hates or is very suspicious of Raphael. Raphael is, I think, less, um, he seems to have been a very uh, Simpatico character, a, a great courtier, very nice young man. Um, and so he doesn't seem to have entertained ill will towards Michelangelo, except insofar as probably very naturally and forgivably, he wanted to equal him or surpass him in his own painting. So we've got what we've talked about before this competition between artists or between these teams of artists happening in. Uh, in in Rome now, um, between uh, these two heavyweight champions of Italian art. And perhaps you could relate the story when Raphael, when Bramante sneaks Raphael into the Sistine Chapel to have a look at what Michelangelo has been working on for the last four years. What does Raphael do uh, to honour Michelangelo? And I think you could almost say at that point, Raphael kind of... Uh, accepts defeats a bit strong, but sort of nods his head to the greatness of Michelangelo. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Michelangelo's great fear was that Raphael was going to see what he was doing. Because what Raphael did was he would cannibalize his teachers. He was um, uh, extremely talented. And he would almost suck his masters dry. He would learn everything from them and almost much much like um much like picasso is sort of famous for sort of not not just borrowing but stealing making someone else's style your own yeah exactly and uh and interestingly enough uh picasso compares himself at one point to Raphael and talks about how when i was 14 i could draw like Raphael. Mm. um and 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 as you say he went on his his career almost um, what the two of them would kind of do would be to to look at a work of art and reverse engineer and figure how it worked out. Picasso obviously did that uh, to uh, such an extent with so many artists reworking their works, doing his own versions of them. And in many ways, the young Raphael was doing that with Perugino, first of all, and then with Leonardo da Vinci, learning from them and trying to exceed them. And you're and you're very aware with when you look at the chronology of Raphael's work, of the stylistic transitions in his work. His early work, even in his early 20s, looks very different to, say, the portrait of Castiglione or the School of Athens. Yeah, absolutely. You know who he's been looking at. You can mm. tell that he's moved to a different city. He's seen different works of art. And, and this is all a good thing. I mean, he's open to everything he wants to learn. And as I say, he seems to have been a, a really nice young guy. Um, and so but Michelangelo, very suspicious and paranoid, very competitive, does not want Raphael to do this to him. He does not want Raphael to out Michelangelo, Michelangelo. And so he is adamant that he does should not get access to see what he's doing. And so we, we can imagine him, Michelangelo, working in great secrecy. But of course, the problem for him is that the guy with the big bunch of keys 
uh, jangling on his belt because he's the chief papal architect is Bramante. The real keys to St. Peter's. <laughs> That's right, yes. Uh, the even better keys that open all the doors. Um, and so uh, what happens is um, he is taken, when Michelangelo went away from Rome at one point, um, uh, Bramante sneaks him into give him a view and we can see you know by torchlight Bramante showing uh, Raphael what uh, Michelangelo has been done and Raphael stunned by it um, and uh, it, it, it astounded at the, the the beauty and the force of what Michelangelo has done and he then goes back to uh, what is arguably his best painting Raphael's mm -hmm. best painting which is the school of Athens which is in the stanza della segnatura uh, the probably the most famous of these Raphael rooms, uh, where uh, the first uh, room that he began working on when he came to Rome, and he uh, puts in the foreground of the School of Athens, which is this beautiful tableau of um, of Athenian philosophy or Greek philosophy. All all the philosophers assembled, Plato and Aristotle uh, are there, Pythagoras, Epicurus, all of these. Uh, figures are gathered together in a kind of debate, uh, like, a, I don't know, the quadrangle of a distinguished college or something like that with students. Scripture. A wonderful, wonderful painting. Um, and Raphael then goes, he had finished it by the time he finally saw what Michelangelo was doing. And he went back to it and then and had plaster put in the foreground and then had another figure added. And that is Heraclitus the Obscure. And he painted him in the, the style of Michelangelo. He's this muscular, brooding uh, figure, this uh, figure with terribilita, which is the sort of awesomeness that Michelangelo put into his figures, whether painting or sculpture. Um, and so, as you say, Raphael, in many ways, is, um, if not admitting defeat, tipping his hat to Michelangelo and now copying his style and saying, your style is worth copying, which is a huge compliment. Uh, but it's also a backhanded tribute because he, it is, I believe, and I'm not the only one who believes this, a portrait of Michelangelo mm -hmm. that Heraclitus is Michelangelo. Even even the age, even the age and everything makes sense, and he the the likeness of um, Heraclitus is very similar to um, other depictions of Michelangelo at the time. Yes, yes, and the key thing for Michelangelo, I mean, we can thank a sculptor named. Uh, uh, Pietro Torrigiani, who <laughs> bashed Michelangelo in the nose when the two of them were crushed it, cr crushed it like a cake. He said, <laughs> like a biscuit. Yes, I mean Torrigiani was a big, strapping fellow, and uh, Michelangelo had, um, you know, taken offense to something he said. And Torrigiani punched and broke his nose, and that then gives us. Uh, we know Michelangelo because he's got this broken nose. Um, and uh, so, yes, Raphael depicts him as Heraclitus. And Heraclitus, if you know anything about him, was this absolutely cantankerous loner who uh, wanted <laughs> uh, to, you know, who hated him. He was a misogynist, not, not, not a misogynist so much as a misanthropist. He hated everyone equally. He wanted to have everyone in Ephesus horse whipped. And, and so, uh, uh, and he's depicted alone. Um, uh, you know, most of the figures in the School of Athens are in these groups of people where there's discussion and so forth. Um, and yet Heraclitus is sitting on his own. And that's Michelangelo, the loner. Uh, so, uh, yes, it's a tribute to Michelangelo. I, I like what you're doing, uh, but I also I'm making a comment about your rather obstreperous personality. It's particularly interesting in, again, to to what we were saying before about Raphael's stylistic transitions being quite blatant. It's, I think it's probably almost the third most impressive figure in that after the figure of Aristotle and Plato, um, but it's so the figuration is so distinctly different to every other figure in the School of Athens. Yes, and I should say the reason that we know that it was added after is not just what was discovered fairly recently when they conserved it, um, it that the plas this is a, a, another layer of plaster that was added uh, but also, I was talking about cartoons, and I said, we've got a Raphael cartoon. That cartoon is now in Milan, um, and it it represents the School of Athens as we know it, as we see it in Rome perfectly, apart from the fact that there is no Heraclitus. And so when he did that, the Heraclitus had not been thought or painted into the work yet. 
Now, and so it is added after the fact, after he has seen what Michelangelo has done in the Sistine Chapel. And again, going back to Neoplatonism in the context of these artists' lives, is there almost a sense that Raphael's figures were ensouled bodies and that Michelangelo's figures were embodied souls in the sense that Michelangelo's figures seem trapped in their bodies and you see that sort of most specifically expressed in his slave statues or in the Medici tombs, but Raphael's figures seem to almost thrive in their existence more. Would you agree with that? There's a kind of grace. I, I guess what the, the way to look at the difference perhaps is that uh, there is struggle uh, in Michelangelo, terrible struggle, uh, sort of mus mus you know, a muscular struggle, which tells us about a spiritual struggle because they're not just fighting physically, they're fighting mentally. Uh, these are um, agonistic and, um, and, and so he's telling us about the, the, the internal struggle, uh, whether uh, with faith, uh, whether with, with anything. I think maybe that's why anyone who has struggled with anything in their life can appreciate some of those images that he's painted. Whereas in Raphael, there's a kind of grace. That was what people liked about Raphael uh, in his own lifetime and, and for fi the 500 years since, is this wonderful equilibrium and balance to them. They're uh, there's a kind of almost a tranquility. And even when he's showing figures who are maybe in a kind of turbulence, as for example, in that figure of Heraclitus, there is nevertheless a kind of sedateness and, and mm. calmness to it. And we don't have the feeling of struggle, physical and mental and spiritual, psychological uh, that we have with Michelangelo. And if you want to see Raphael at his best, you can and, and see the way he depicts uh, figures with this beauty, uh, the beauty of color and form, not just, don't just go if you're uh, lucky enough to be in Rome to the Vatican and the Stanza della Segnatura, where you're, it, it's absolutely packed uh, when you go in almost all of the time for understandable reasons. Um, but a much better viewing experience is Santa Maria della Pace in Rome, where you can see, you can go, you'll be, there'll be three other people in the church with you. Um, and you can, you can see up close and personal um, the paintings that he's done there. And, and you get that sort of, and, and, and there's a very good expression, the idea of the ensouled bodies, that uh, the, the beauty of these figures, which is really a kind of celestial. And, that's what, and you can see in there why all, if you're an artist, all roads in Rome led to Raphael. You wanted to work with him. You wanted to someone to work with someone who cr could create these beautiful figures. And that's why all patrons, of course, wanted Raphael as well. Mm. It's interesting. I, um, again, back to the sort of materiality and weighed down effect of Michelangelo's figures. My, like most of my friends back in uh, Australia aren't involved in the art world at all. Most of them are sort of uh, actually in, in the construction industry, but I love getting their opinion on art much more than I like talking to someone I went to art school about art because it's, I don't know, their their mind isn't sort of polluted by the same kind of pretentious jargon that you get, get at art school. You get a much more face value uh, impression of the work. And I was showing my friend Jacob um, back home um, a reproduction of The Last Judgment and he we were talking about that, the, the, the sense of, you know, um, weightless bodies versus weighed down bodies. And he made the point that the figures, the damned figures in The Last Judgment, it takes more angels to carry them than it takes to carry the angels, that, the figures that are ascending into heaven. And I just thought that was such a sort of, but I love, I love that. It's sort of, um, I mean, I think people are often scared to actually say how they feel about a painting because they're worried about sounding stupid or whatever, but it's so much more accurate, I think, to a, to a piece then. Um, and these paintings and sculptures were meant to be seen by everyone. They were not meant, you know, often people try to read, and, and this is maybe a little bit of the problem I have with uh, seeing a kind of private symbolism in a lot of the art of the, the Renaissance. I, for the most part, this art was meant to tell stories. It was meant to make you feel something. It was meant to, to make you... To the illiterate as well was one of the main things. It was specifically designed for people who uh, didn't have this sort of elitist, higher understanding of art. The church had struggled with the idea of images because there had been iconoclasm in the East, in the Byzantine uh, world, uh, in 
uh, the seventh and eighth century AD, and and the, the church somehow had to come to grips with this. Will if we paint a beautiful icon, will people begin to worship that? What is the value of art? Is art going to take us away from God because it will take us and it will become idolatry, which is what they felt was happening in Byzantium. Um, and on the other hand, what the church decided in the Middle Ages, thanks to people like Aquinas, uh, who, you know, the angelic doctor, no one is more canonical um, than, and, uh, th than Thomas Aquinas. He's a, a saint after all. And Aquinas said, look, it's okay, painting works. Because what painting does is tell stories to the illiterate, um, and so th these these works are meant to be seen uh, for all of us of whatever educational attainment or aesthetic sensibility. And so I think that's why all views of these works of art are valid. Because, and I would love to be a fly on the wall in 1512 when the Sistine Chapel was unveiled, or when in 1498, when the Last Supper was, and to know what people said about it. And there were probably some people who were very, uh, you know, felt constrained to make uh, pretentious remarks about it, as you would get today if you go to an art exhibition, but also other people who would make very sincere and genuine, re give, giving vo voice to their visceral reactions to the art. And it's that second kind of reaction that I think artists today, and also Michelangelo, Raphael, Leonardo da Vinci, Donatello, whoever also would have appreciated much, much more. Mm, I completely agree. And I was, to that point, actually, there was an idea that I want to run past you, and it, this might seem a bit too neat or contrived to be true. But in so in the late 15th and early 16th century Italian, Italian Renaissance, there's a dramatic increase in the realism of paintings. Was this driven, at least in part, by the desire to convey the word of God as accurately as possible, since one of the functions was to explain the New Testament to the illiterate, wouldn't it follow that the more realistically uh, a scene was painted, the more easily and holistically it could be understood? Because uh, a stick figure drawing of the Virgin Mary is far less conceptually and philosophically pregnant than a Raphael painting of the Virgin Mary. Yes, uh, the, the story is an interesting one because there's a progression and it's not a straightforward progression. If I, I would begin, I'll try not to uh, make, make this, uh, to stretch this out too much, but if we go back to the early 1200s, we have St. Francis of Assisi who wants to make Christianity, who wants to make the Bible stories Real mean something to the people in Assisi and uh, Foligno and the, the, and wherever he's traveling around Italy, these little villages. He wants them to know the stories, the illiterate people who work in the fields. And so he begins doing things like making little tableaus, having nativity plays like the, the crib at Greccio that uh, he uh, did one Christmas so people could understand the what the nativity story was. And so I th in many ways... Francis is the beginning of this story of making art real. You have to take it to the people. You have to give them something that they will recognize. And so this is then brought to its height in the century after his death uh, by Giotto, uh, who come, is, you know, was painting in the late 1200s, early 1300s. And Giotto brings us reality, brings us human forms, brings us landscape backgrounds, brings us figures that have gravity, weight, volume, all of these things to them, uh, rather than the flat imagery that we've been used to from Byzantine art, for example. But, and so you would expect this would continue, but what happens is, in fact, by the second half of the 1300s, there's a movement in art away from that kind of realism, which might be linked to the Black Death, because, of course, it comes along at mid-century, kills half the population of Europe. One of the questions that's asked about the Black Death is, why is God punishing us? One of the reasons might have been we were being too secular in our appreciation of art. We were making the Virgin Mary look too much like a woman and too little like a goddess, the Queen of Heaven. Likewise, we were making Christ look like a poor peasant, right. not like the King of Heaven. And so there is this backlash against it. The other thing might be that the Black Death killed off all of the avant-garde, the people who wanted the more avant-garde Jota style art. And what we had were the poor people from the country coming into the city who said, we want that older style of art. We don't like this new stuff. 
Um, but nevertheless, then through the 1400s, we have increasing verisimilitude, part of which is responding exactly as you say to the needs of the church and for um, uh, to illustrate the Bible stories in ways that can be understood by the masses. And we therefore get in works by people like Domenico Ghirlandaio, if we have a, a, a scene from the Bible in the, or a scene from the life of a saint, we'll often have Florence in the background, recognizably Florence, so that people, when they come into the Tornaboni Chapel in the Dominican Basilica of Santa Maria Novella in Florence, and look up at those scenes from the life of the Virgin, the life of Christ, they can say, ah, uh, yes, I can now imagine how it happened, because I can, imagine, I can think my way into it happening in the streets outside the basilica. Um, the other thing they're responding to, especially in sculpture, though, is ancient art, and verisimilitude, making it real, is what the ancient Greeks and Romans excelled at. And so if we're going to copy them, and we're going to go beyond them, we have to do the same sort of art that they did with that same level of attention to detail. Um, and so it's really the two things. It's the demands of the church, but it's also the kind of ideological demand of let's uh, do, let's go back and revive the style of art of the ancients. But the two things obviously went very well together. And of course, it reaches its climax, that desire for verisimilitude in Caravaggio, almost 100 years later, in, who was, of course, criticised for his excessive realism because, you know, he depicted the death of the Virgin with, you know, a bloated stomach or uh, Jesus without a beard. But then, because the, one of the dictates of the Council of Trent wasn't it to be above all else realistic, and so that sort of points to the church's need uh, around the 1560s to have to, you know, convey the word of God in a way that would be more easily subsumed by um, the general population and especially the illiterate, since they were the majority of the population. Um, but also not to have, uh, there had to be a kind of re regal dignity. Reverence. Uh, to, yes, yeah. to those characters and not make them look. One of the arguments that, uh, some people within the church, such as Girolamo Savonarola, who was the Dominican friar in Florence in the 1490s, who had wanted a kind of moral reform of the church and of society, he believed that Florence had become too, uh, too secular, and that what was happening was they were making, he was saying, you're making the Virgin Mary look like a prostitute, she does not look like the Virgin. And so these are the paintings that he wanted to burn in his bonfires of the vanities, and have them destroyed and make work much more pious. And so the bar of good, a good work of art wasn't so much its verisimilitude and how realistic it looked. And you'd look at it and say, the Virgin Mary looks just like that woman down the street who works in the sweet shop where I get my candied almonds. Um, you would look at the work of art and say, she looks like the queen of heaven. She, I, I could, this is someone I can pray to. This work is going to help me in my spiritual endeavors. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite section of the Sistine ceiling? Ah, uh, well, without doubt, it is uh, the, for, if, if it's the prophet Jonah. Uh, we don't have the effect from him that uh, people would have had uh, what, you know, five centuries ago. We now come in at the altar wall when you come into the Sistine Chapel. You come in in the altar under the damned, um, and uh, so we don't get the great visual effect that they would have had when they came in at the opposite mm -hmm. end, um, you know, not the altar, and they came in um, at, the, at the other end of it, and they would look up, they would look at it, and the first figure they would have seen was Jonah, who was at the far end, uh, low on the ceiling, um, and he is reared back in his seat, uh, looking up. Uh, he's looking up at the, the fresco. He is the one who leads us into it. And so Michelangelo deliberately designed that uh, so that he's... Uh, and uh, Jonah has this look of incredulity on his face, which is the look of incredulity we have. We imitate Jonah when we come in. We immediately tilt back and look up. But there's another thing about it, which is remarkable is it's one of the the first trompe l'oeil paintings mm -hmm. it's the trick of an eye because he's leaning backwards and so we see him his head looks to be farther away from us than his feet 
but as we walk closer, we realize the curve of the vault is such that his head is closer to us than his feet. And so he's actually reversed uh, in a very clever and difficult way, uh, reversed the way in which we, um, uh, uh, we assimilate visually uh, this the picture of the prophet. And this is a rebuke to Bramante, who said, Michelangelo cannot paint from below upwards. This is someone who, after three or four years of working in the Sistine Chapel, is an absolute master of not just the fresco technique, but the technique of painting on a curved wall. Think how difficult that is. You're painting on a, cur a curved surface. This is not a flat surface that you can stand in the comfort of your studio, he is on a scaffold, uh, you know, 100 feet in the air, uh, painting on a curved vault for people who are going to be seeing it from, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 feet away um, from the ground. So it's it, it, it's really a virtuoso performance. And it's not just my favorite bit, it's the, 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 it's the, what, the part that most people commented on in the 1500s when they went to see it because quite rightly they were stunned by it. Yeah, he utilizes the perspective system the best in the figure of Jonah. And it's amazing when you walk in, he almost looks like he's sort of half seated on like a, a piece of stone overhanging the actual vault. And it looks like he's almost about to fall off or something. That's, that's right, um, that's right. He almost seems to be detached from it. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, the, the prophets and the civils are my favorite figures in them. I love the... Um, the Libyan Sybil, but mainly um, based mainly because of the drawing as well that he did from it, which I, I actually was obsessed with that drawing uh, when I was a lot younger and used to sort of copy it all the time. And yeah, beautiful. The, the yellow is so beautiful. Uh, but I always feel sorry for whoever was the model for that because yeah. uh, she, or more likely he, because he, I think mm. the model is probably uh, male. Uh, must have had to go to the chiropractor for uh, for weeks or months afterwards or been in traction or something because it would have been such a difficult pose to hold. Mm. Perhaps no artist has left more of a mark on the Western canon of art than Michelangelo. And as we've discussed, his career was also defined by tempestuous relationships with patrons and critics. Because of this, do you think that Michelangelo is perhaps more responsible than any other artist for establishing the cult of the artist, the idea of the artist as an independent thinker, immune to the criticisms or suggestions of his patrons? And in that sense, did he elevate the art form more than anyone else? Yeah, I would, I would say yes to everything, except maybe the very last bit about more than anyone else, because the other one who did was Leonardo da Vinci. Mm -hmm. I think it was the two of them in tandem, the fact that we get these two incredibly powerful figures who are almost contemporaries. And it's the two of them, I think together, that really um, liberate the artist. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci wanted to make painting a and art in general, a liberal art, uh, something that, uh, because previous to that, artists were seen, you know, pretty much as like a bootmaker or a drapers and anyone else who worked with his hands or her hands in some cases, uh, people in the wool industry. Um, and there were people such as Borso d'Este, the Duke of Ferrara, who would pay frescoists by the square foot in the way that you would pay a, uh, someone according to the, uh, for a robe according to the amount of material used. And so they were really seen as any other craftsman. But Leonardo da Vinci wanted recognition that we are working with our brains as well as with our hands. And therefore, we're on par with people like poets and philosophers. And so he and Michelangelo are the ones who, in many ways, defy the expectations and des desires of the patron and say that we are, um, we're the ultimate arbiters of what's good in art and what we should be doing. Leonardo da Vinci has the famous quote where he fell out with the members of the confraternity in Milan who had commissioned from him uh, the altarpiece, which became the Virgin of the Rocks, which is now in the Louvre. Uh, he fell out with them effectively over how much they were going to pay him or how much they were not going to pay him and pay him. And he said, um, blind men should not be allowed to judge art. And uh, which is a remarkable thing to, for a young painter who had, Leonardo was in his very early 30s at this point, doesn't have a lot to his name. 
And yet he is rebuking some of the most, the wealthiest and powerful members in Milan, the elite of Milan, and telling them that you don't know what you're talking about. I am the artist and I'm the one who does this. And that's a remarkable moment in the history of art where you get a painter telling the patron that uh, the man who's paying the men in this case, who are paying the bills, I'm the one who's the ultimate arbiter of what's good about this. And so we get the two of them just by their sheer forces of personality. And of course, their talent. They're the ones who allow artists to step out from the shadow of their patrons and become people who are working for themselves and for their own reputations as much as for the people who are paying them. Well, I think we can uh, wrap it up there, Ross. And I've got a lot to thank you for because uh, your work via my dad was the reason I first got into art, as I've said, and uh, was the first introduction I had. Wonderful to hear. Great compliment. And and the first introduction I had to um, who I sort of now regard as the goat as far as art goes and Michelangelo. And, um, yeah, you've been really generous through the time and thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, Julius.